This is Bridge Academy in Dresden Mills. It was built in 1890 through the generosity of the Bridge and Lithgow funds. It was uh, funds and family. It was intended for a secondary high school education for the children of Dresden from the age of 10 to 21 and served that purpose until the mid-1960s. At that time, the, most of the students were going out of town, tuitioned out of town, and it uh, became the home for some of the town lower grades. Uh, when they tuitioned the junior and senior, the seventh and eighth grade to Wiscasset and the building was closed. It was uh, in a short time changed into a library? In, into a public library and it's been used by for that and for meetings of various groups the Planning Board, Conservation Commission meet there regularly Historical Society in the winter time and other other groups as it comes along. It's, and the uh, the funds also provide a scholarship to many of the college-bound students of Dresden, and they support the Dresden Communicator, a monthly newsletter. You were talking about these the tower here. What can you tell me about the tower? The building was George A. Clough of Boston. It is of a modified colonial style, the entire building, with pointed gables surmounted by a spire 30 feet high. And I might add that that spire uh, was probably primarily uh, built for a circula circulation system, air circulation system in the building. But it never had a bell in it, or? And it never had a, never had a bell, uh, not that I know of. Now, what years can you remember? Let me I think the first class graduated in 1891. There had been something for a high school building up to this, but the building supposedly was built in 1890, and I believe it was the mid-1960s that it ceased to be a school at all. Well, what years did you attend? I attended here from 1942 through 46. My brother had graduated uh, 10 years before me. My, my mother graduated in 1908. Hmm. Doris's father uh, attended here uh, much earlier than that. Girl coming, driving in here and putting our brakes on and turning around on the ice. Well, that's the way I wanted to head out anyway, she uh -huh. said. <laughs> and, uh, Where was the playground? Do you remember? Well, uh, the tennis tennis court was there, uh, which was used some. Uh, the boys played baseball and the girls softball some. We had the makings of the the basketball court over there, but it was not paved at that time, and in the spring it was just mud that we played in. Uh huh. And what kinds of uh, uh, playground things? I remember like hopscotch and jump rope. Well, this uh, see, this would have been uh, uh, teenagers, so uh, oh, okay. we were a little bit beyond okay. the hopscotch and probably a uh, marble age. There was one uh, one game that we played was uh, dodgeball. Uh, mm -hmm. There was one one girl that uh, she had quite a quite a swing when she you you didn't want to be in uh, her sight when uh, when she swung the ball. There was no uh, gymnasium, though, was there? Hmm? Was there a gymnasium? No, no, there wasn't. So what did no. you do for that for the winter? Uh we went out, we bought uh, toboggans, we, we went uh, slide in, and when there was snow, uh, 
we walked for exercise on top of walking to school and walking home. And uh, we, we stuck pretty much to, to educational things. There was a, uh, you know, there was a bowling alley in the basement at the time I went here. And they played ping pong. Okay. One of her means of transportation was to drive a horse and buggy over here every morning. And there was, uh, in back of you, uh, towards the river, the wharf, there was a place for her to stable the horse. That wasn't too far to go and feed it at noontime. If she had to stable up on the, on the hill somewhere, Quite a little walk to get up there and feed the horse and get back and eat a lunch too. <laughs> left, left is the Masonic Temple that replaced uh, one an earlier one that burned after just a few years of occupancy. This house on the right was uh, moved down the river from up in Pittston, just over the Pittston line, which is really only a couple of miles off probably. The new post office is a modern building. This is the Jewett Fire Station. Three buildings right here at, uh, well, until the 50s. One right across the, right across the road here. Next to that, just beyond those uh, two trees, there was a long building that was the office of Dr. Daw. It was a long time doctor here in town. And uh, uh, about to the left of those two shrubs, there was a, a house there that was an old Blinn house. That was moved and reassembled in Pittston up to Tut Hill. Right straight ahead was a combination store, machine shop, garage, and apartment. That was Doris Savini's home place. Uh, a lot of these places burn or? No, that was uh, built by the Methodist. Uh, I can't give you the date right now in the late 1800s. And it served that way. Uh, I don't know when, when it closed. As a, as a Methodist church, then it served for some independent churches for a little while. That's an interesting feature up there in the center. That's a, uh, it was uh, the dove, uh -huh. dove piece in the center. It but had, was it ever a clock window or just, just a window? Just a window. I don't. Mm -hmm. I, uh, we, we never had any um, stained glass in, mm -hmm. uh, in this building. It, uh, it did have a spire and a steeple and bell. Mm -hmm. and I have some pictures of, of that coming and going. And I see it looks like a, a buggy over there. Uh, it's a, an antique shop now. Uh huh. And a bell? Is that a local bell? No, or? that's a bell that was in the... Uh, in the uh, tower, and it was uh, brought up river, uh, up the eastern river from Boston. Bruce Alexander can tell us the story of that. It's one of his ancestors, I believe, a call. Was it a Revere Bell? Or? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. On the eastern river now. Yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, this was a small wharf right down here. Uh, and at one point it was a shipbuilding area. Mm, well, nothing of any, boat. nothing of any size. Uh, something that they would build in their yard and uh, then haul to the to the river, probably, possibly. But smelting was always something that happened. Smelting, I don't know how far back that uh, dates, but we're coming to an area. This is. This was a smelting, well, there were, in fact, there were two, two channels here. And they could uh, fish one tide on this side and then 
go over to the other side and fish the outgoing tide. Uh, oh, so there's a different channel for there, each there's two, there was, Well, two eddies there anyway uh -huh. that, uh, that made that spot rather unique. They still must be there today, right? Eh? Uh, there is still some smelting going on in the Eastern River, but after the Kenny Bank got cleaned up, and I guess they think probably even more so since the dam at Augusta was taken out, uh, the constant, the, more of the smelt run is up the Kenny Bank rather than up the Eastern River. Oh, okay. The Eastern River used to be a very pure river because it didn't drain any uh, large inhabitants, any large metropolitan areas, no commercial, no no factories or anything going into it. But now it's different? Uh, it is in a way because the carp have got into the river and it is very muddy very turbid, hmm. where it used to be 50 more years ago, very, very clear water. So it, it's silted in? It, so it, it's uh, silted in and uh, it's just suspended in the, in the water. We're coming to the old townhouse up ahead here on the right. So that's where you had town meetings? And stuff. Well, we had town meetings. This building was uh, built in uh, 1860 for a town house. And the history of Dresden can give us details on that. It was originally a one-story building, the Grange built onto it in 1904. The Grange had uh, raised the roof and put the addition on the back end for a kitchen and for a stage upstairs. So there were plays here? There were plays, there was dances, uh, but uh, the Grange held their meetings here, which were at least monthly, if not more frequently. And for the town, it was uh, where the town meetings were held. The town offices were never in here. There was a time when they considered moving in, and I felt it was a waste of space, but I think right now uh, they could use that space and some more, perhaps. It is on the National Register of Historic Sites. They did raise it up and put something for a foundation, but put a good foundation under it about a year ago. It's not, I guess, not full height all the way. It has to come by now. Uh, well, it was built as a multifunctional building at the time. We are now in the area uh, more like Dresden, known as Dresden Center, although it wasn't and it's not actually even in the center of town. The center of town is still off to the east office. But the, the, uh, was the, I suppose there was a ferry here and then one of the early bridges spanned the river. When the first bridge was built, but this is the, this is the approach to it. So it was down much lower and it landed on the ledge, I believe, on the other side. Um, they made an effort to save it in the 36th flood, but uh, it was pretty rickety even before the flood. So this, uh, this bridge was built probably about 1937. And to me, it's one of the few bridges I know of that's on a, on a, a slant. It isn't, it isn't level. It's higher on one end than on the other. They did a major repainting job on that. Doesn't seem so that many years ago, but it's... It looks like it's rusted so, out there. Showing a lot of rust now. Mm. That is the so-called middle bridge. There are three bridges in Dresden spanning the Eastern River, and they are aptly named the 
upper, middle and lower bridge. Although the lower bridge, when it was rebuilt, was dedicated as a memorial bridge to the servicemen. Mm -hmm. okay. There has been a an active uh, smelting colony downstream here from the bridge. Also another one, uh, perhaps less popular, was uh, upstream from the bridge. And you can see from uh, the boats in the river that there's a little, uh, well some of it is recreational boating. The uh, float here in the foreground, I believe that fellow, goes eeling. Uh, or some other type of fishing. He's a local fellow. So uh, the area, part of the area first settled by the French or German Huguenots, whichever the Huguenots that came in 1754. Uh, there was, uh, well, the, the can't say that the original buildings, because we don't know. We don't know, but there are some of the old build, old houses, old farmsteads here. This area was uh, in well, the last century or so purchased by a Boston gentleman who had tr uh, horses in Boston, and he wanted the hay to feed the horses and the. Uh, family eventually uh, came here summers and then uh, the descendants uh, decided to live here year round. So it was kept in farmland? It's been kept in farmland and it is in a strict conservation easement. Mm. This, this part here that you're looking at. Did they ever ship hay uh, uh, down the river to places like Boston from yeah, Dresden? a lot. Mm -hmm. A lot. They, uh, it was pressed. It was long before the days of the current bailing, either the square or the big round ones, but it was put into a barn and kept uh, kept there for a certain number of days. They wanted to be sure it was dry. There was some law about how many days or weeks that it had to be in storage, and then they, were, they pressed it into great big bales and shipped it that way. And this was by barge in the river? Or? Barge, uh, steamboat. Uh, I, I don't know whether they would possibly... I don't know how uh, Mr. Foster uh, got it from from here to Boston. Whether it was by boat from the Eastern River, whether it was taken to uh, the Kennebec and loaded, and might have been taken even to uh, Richmond and shipped by train. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, I don't know what to say. Well, it you was, said this is one of the original. Oh, okay. Um, along the driveway here, somewhere, I don't know where it is, the uh, neighbors probably do, was the site of the log cabin of Dr. Casimir Mayers, who was one of the first settlers of town. And I believe it was a Louise Mayers, and I'm not sure of that, that... Uh, he had the original part of the house that I had that we're looking at. What was the Charles Estony Hoodlet House, another 1754 settler of the area. Certainly it's been enlarged upon since he came here, but uh, it is a... When people could see it from anywhere, it uh, certainly stands out as quite a handsome house and L shed and barn. This building was built by a, a group of ladies. Built in uh, 1867 and uh, the Ladies' Society maintained it as a meeting place for various groups from um, dances and church. I guess they held various church services here, various church functions, uh, high school dances, uh, suppers, and uh, 
then uh, while they even rented it out to, to someone that had a appliance store in here for a little while. Then uh, the society was, uh, well, they were running out of membership and running out of funds and the fire department needed a build bigger building, a building that they could get the bigger trucks into, and a deal was made with the Palmerboro Society and the town to, uh, the town was given a deed. So we're coming up to... This is what is locally known as Palmerboro Four Corners, of the uh, intersection of 197 and 128. The, uh, Firehouse was on the left, the uh, Forest Grove Cemetery is on the right. Tell us about the cemetery. Well, there, there are some uh, quite old stones, very old stones here. Some of the, Many of the old families of, of this uh, part of town, at least, there's a triple stone of the Mayer's family down there. Um, it's very, these tall pines are, make it very picturesque. Yes, they are. And we, we have a cemetery in town that is known as Pine Grove Cemetery with no pines in it now. And this is Forest Hill. It started the Historical Society. We are uh, at the, what's the new term, is the campus of the Dresden Historical Society. I'd rather say it was the complex. It includes the 1816 brick schoolhouse, which uh, replaced, I believe, a earlier wooden building. And in recent years, we were given another school building that was Located in a different part, you're looking at the uh, at the brick building now, and that was our our home um, museum for well 25 or 30 years. And we have quite a quite an interesting display and uh, collection of things in that. We needed more room. We went looking for another building, should we build, should we with this or that, and we were given this other school building, which we thought was so big, it set up on the bank and it looked so big, and I don't think really it's got any more square footage than the the brick one has, but it's, uh, it is on a complete uh, foundation. We, uh, Did have quite a job to get it moved here. When it, Where was it originally? It was uh, over uh, south of uh, Middle Bridge area. But, uh, so if you could tell me about the brick building once again. No, I don't. What, what, what period is it from? 1816 to about in, uh, 1964, I think. It was a uh, one room, eight grades for many years, and then when they got to transporting the children by bus, it was cut down to two grades here, two grades in Dresden Mills, etc. Doris Souvigny did teach here, but was not the last teacher, I believe. I think, no, she must have had just just two grades, and this area where the yellow building is was the playground for them. The town didn't own it. In fact, in the early days, they hardly owned land enough to walk around the building. Now, the two doors, what? Two do I don't know how they were used here. Did the boys go in one? Whether it was boys and uh, one for boys and one for girls, or one was the main entrance and the other. As far as I know, this building never had any woodshed as such, and 
uh, from appearances to the floor, the um, notches in the floor, I would say that uh, a lot of the wood was stacked in the entryway to, uh, in this corner of the building. Now, would the students be responsible for helping start the fires and probably, keeping them? Probably. Uh, the, one of the older students, uh, hopefully one that lived uh, nearby, would be the janitor, would, would get up. Just about and a... Some, sometimes it was uh, the teacher that uh, might live nearby and uh, do it. Uh, there might be an, uh, an elderly gentleman, possibly, in the neighborhood that... Uh, didn't mind getting up and uh, at least starting the fire. The teacher and the students were responsible for keeping it going during the day. And what about, was it an outhouse always? Wait, let's start. Uh, at, uh, the, the years and years ago, I think the students had to go outside to go to the outhouse. It was an outhouse at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, then a, a wooden addition has been built on and it is still on the on the back of the building today and uh, it's been uh, actively used. We have been fortunate in renovating the yellow, the wooden building to have a lot of help from the work crew from the Two Bridges Jail in Wiscasset and they have been a tremendous help to us and if we had known earlier they would have could have done more that we had to pay for. Well, that a schoolhouse be made out of brick, isn't it? It is, uh, in a way, and in fact, there's one wooden building, school building here in town, that replaced a brick building. I suspect it was a small building, and they needed a bigger one, and, uh, well, economically, it was <laughs> cheaper to build a wooden one than, than a brick. I, but uh, Dresden has one brick uh, school, Pittston has a brick school, and there, there are some around, and perhaps they're the ones that have been, been saved because of the... Did you have brick factories down on the river? Oh, yeah. yeah. Do, do we, are there any remnants of that? Or? Just uh, where the left off, cast off bricks show up. Uh -huh. and but yep. they built, uh, they had them right by the river, usually, because um, that's where the clay was? Probably, probably. They wanted the water, they wanted to be able to um, ship them somewhere. Um, there was, my great-grandfather made brick on our wharf, and the sand was nearby, the water was there, the hay was uh, on the farm, and the clay was... Uh, 1,500 feet away, something like that, so uh, that was one reason, I presume, why he made brick, and they were, I think a lot of them were shipped by water, and I know some went to Richmond, but I suspect probably more of them went to, well, the cities, even uh, Portland or Boston. brick house. This re just replaced a brick house. And he's uh, torn down the last stable and uh, clear pine carpenters, a lot of knots in it. Some down there. So this was good bottom land yes. from wherever, right? right. And we're at the Gorenson farm right at, now. Uh, at one time, uh, it was kind of a corporation, uh, several that owned it together and they called it the Tween Rivers Farm. Did you get that? Well, Did you we recall could do it, it again. At one time there was a, a group of people uh, owned it and they called it the Tween Rivers Farm. They they grew vegetables. I, well, I've heard of you know, cabbage. I don't know what else that they grew here. But the strawberry industry Strawberries started? came in uh, quite, quite a lot later in the, well, if you get a chance to talk with Rob Gleason, he can probably give you the, the date of it. I imagine it was in the 50s? late 50s, early 60s. It would have been, I think that was primarily Rob Gleason's 
project rather than his uncle's and uh, it was when he got back from the Marines that he bought some of the farmland and and, and went into it. And, and what other crops were general down here? Uh, Potatoes? Well, his uncle started out with an apple orchard. And he, he grew the seedlings, and he planted the seedlings, and he had all this land in between. So he couldn't let that go to waste, and he started raising uh, primarily corn, maybe a squash, things in between the young apple trees. And then when the apple trees got bigger, and he uh, still wanted to raise some crops, then he expanded onto open farmland and he was uh, he rented some of our farmland he had some strawberries there in the beginning and then he oh I think he had sweet corn and he had uh, cannon factory squash I don't know whether he ever had any pumpkins yes he, I, think, I think he had pumpkins as well at the house and then uh, did he have a farm stand uh, he had a farm stand in that it uh, was where he sold his apples and where he packed his apples and he had uh, cold storage for his apples. It was his apple barn. That that has been their, their farm stand. The, the nephew somewhere along the line got into strawberries and whereas when my folks raised strawberries we only had uh, two acres most of the time. One year we had maybe two and a half acres. We picked for the market. We had pickers in. And then when they got small, we would let the public in to pick for themselves. <laughs> um, down here, they went into it in 10, 15, 20 acres, and they picked for the market too, probably, but they also had acres and acres that they let the public in to pick. pick your own. Two different ways of marketing strawberries, in my estimation. Mm -hmm. Then uh, uh, Pop got into the strawberries as well, and there's some kind of competition. Then uh, the Gleasons stopped both the strawberries and other vegetables that they may have been raising as well as the care of the orchard. They stopped it entirely. He sold most of the land, deeded most of the land to the Inland Fisheries and Wildlife uh, game preserve, whatever they wanted to do with it. Uh, Fish and Game has uh, allowed and with contracts allowed people like the Goransons, I guess maybe David Pop to a degree and the Carlsons and others farm the better part of the land but they've let the apple orchard go wild entirely. They had to uh, they wanted to be organic, so they had to let it lay fur or, or not plant it anything for three years. And this is about the fifth year, and I see they probably got winter rye on it right now. It's been seeded down again. Oh, yeah, it's wildlife management. Uh, this is uh, land that the Carlsons have leased from the state. This is the Carlson house over here. The Carlson farm. They and the Goransons both came from Aroostook County down here. Oh, okay. uh, the apple orchard that Steve Powell started and he is probably a name that you will be hearing off and on throughout the series. And he was a biologist for inland fisheries and wildlife. He built this house 
here overlooking Mary Meadon Bay. He kept quite an accurate record of the, when the geese and the ducks showed up in the spring and when they left in the fall and a rough count of how many there were on a certain date. And uh, he also tapped maple trees and he kept a log of when they first tapped and how many gallons they boiled down that season. Uh, his nephew has that information. He was a, a trapper. Um, he was into a little bit of everything, but the view out over the Eastern River comes into Mary Meadon Bay. And it's looking, looking down towards Carney's Point, which is off the end of the breakwater, which divides Eastern River and the main ship channel of the Guinea Bag. And uh, this is a migrating waterfowl area? Yes, yes. Well, it certainly was in the Powell days here. There's nowhere near the number of uh, geese, anyway, in the rivers there was 50, 60 years ago. And do we know why? Why there are so few, few now? Or? This is a, an early, or oh, there were early settlers. I don't know just where the first call family did live. They, I read just the other day that the house was on. No, they, they were buried on the banks of the river, but that could be most anywhere. But the, the call had a ferry somewhere near where the bridge is now that we will be coming to. And back, there is a small cemetery in back of us with a Revolutionary War veteran and his wife in there. Uh, he was Clancy. He was David. Bear Clancy, I believe his wife was a call. This is, uh, this bridge was, well, it wasn't passable at, for a number of years, and then it was built and uh, dedicated to the veterans. It was in the early 50s, I believe, it was built. The uh, house on the left may have been the pool house for the, for the bridge one time. The, this house on the right was built by Captain Patterson in the 1860s. And you can probably get a better view of it from up beyond. The 1860s? 17. 17. 17. 17. You're not getting a picture of Maramedan Bay. Yeah, you got it. Swan Island in the background. This land was purchased and the house lot cut out and some group, I don't know the fishing claim, has got the how far back uh, it goes back beyond before the Costello family, I don't know. Impassable. Because it was just dirt, or it was yeah, it was it was. Uh, I believe it was dirt. At least if they had got it tarred at one time, it wasn't maintained. So the land values in this area were not very high. Not very, not very much. No. This uh, these roads are coming to was a. Uh, Road goes from the Eastern River to the Kenny Bag. Oh. So was there a ferry over there? At one time? Uh, no, I well probably there was to a degree. But not a car ferry. Oh no, no, no. no Just somebody's we, boat. We were uh, probably had all three bridges. So this is another view of the Gorenson farm. Yes. And the Gorensons moved down from Arista? They came from Arista County, yes. Mm -hmm. 
And this was what? This was Granny Riddle's Tavern. They, uh, she ran a tavern, and I don't know if her husband was the uh, sea captain. I, there was a, a Riddle that was a sea captain that I can give you more information about later on. And this was, uh, you know, served alcoholic beverages and food and what? And lodging. Uh -huh. uh, well, I don't know. I think of a, I think of a tavern as uh, around here is more of a lodging than uh, than anything. But uh, full yes. How uh, liquor? I I don't know. There is uh, some thought that that this house may have been moved up from near the river, but it's, uh, I've got no proof of it. Just an assumption on part of some of the descendants. The, uh, there was a store building here, and a child's door operated it as a uh, motorcycle and uh, snowmobile shop. Sold and repaired them. Little Courthouse, 1761. You going in? Uh, yeah. Let me just change this a little bit. Well, not not really. It's 1761 courthouse built for the courts of the newly formed Lincoln County. It is uh, certainly the oldest existing uh, court building in the state of Maine, if not in New England. Now, Palmerboro itself was the center of settlement, wasn't it, well, in the early it, days? Uh, it was certainly. Uh, ranked uh, ranked over Wiscasset at the time. Jay Robbins is here. He could give you the whole spiel, but you haven't got the no. wife and the batteries to do that. <laughs> oh, we can always plug in. And this house up on the right? Here? Well, this house is, uh, it is a much more modern, uh, modern house. It was built in the late 1800s. And uh, it was, all the land presumably was in the Goodwin family in the beginning, but uh, it is separate land now. And what function does the courthouse have today? Uh, it is owned by the Lincoln County Historical Association. It is uh, maintained, uh, preserved for its history. It was lived in for from 1794 when the uh, courts left here, uh, probably most of the time until it was sold out of the family to the Historical Association in 1954. Early here, and uh, before that, it was called Frank. Foot, Frankfort, but uh, and why they? Well, the the fort uh, was able to overlook the reaches of the river up and down and down to the foot of uh, the head of Swan Island. Whether that was the reason uh, for the fort being here, I don't know. Was the was the turnpike, was the main thoroughfare in the early days. And um, So basically you couldn't, even if there were families, German families here, they, they wouldn't be able to go to, say, Walderboro, uh, uh, except by boat, right? They, that, well, probably... Uh, down the Kennebec and prob around? Prob probably they would. There is a record of someone from, I believe, the Walderboro area, apparently knowing of land in Richmond, and whether he had bought it then or whether he could uh, stake a claim to it then. He traveled overland with a sled, I believe, pulled by oxen, with a hogshead on the sled that he lived in. 
not only while he was traveling, but after he got to his land in Richmond and lived in it until he built a log cabin, returned and got his family and settled in Richmond. What's a hogshead? That's, that was a hard way of doing, but mm -hmm. he did. We're looking towards the uh, Richmond shore and uh, back a uh, hundred years ago there were large sets of ice houses over there. I think we're looking towards the, uh, the Knickerbocker ice houses. Either the Knickerbocker or the Haynes and Duet has grown up so I can't tell. And otherwise we are approaching the uh, area <laughs> known as Cedar Grove, it uh, built up primarily because of the ice industry that came to the area. It, uh, it had a store, a post office, um, school a little ways along, but uh, no, no church, but it was because of the, of the ice houses. The, first house on the left uh, replaced uh, one that was built by the ice company. The next one is a remodeled one of uh, the ice company house. Uh, just a moment, in here. It's a, uh, known as the largest cottonwood in the state of Maine. And the house, there is an old house up beyond there. It was an old tricross house one of the original early settlers to the area. Several buildings here on the left in uh, in the what's the bushes now. One was the uh, there was a large two story two and a half story store uh, an apartment uh, overhead which also housed the post office. This side of it there was a another building that was, my mother called it the grain mill, where they sold and stored grain. Um, they had the bowling alley later on in the, on the ground floor and a dance hall on the second floor. It was known as Moody's Casino. And up beyond where we see the poles, utility poles that are been trimmed out. That's where the Cedar Grove ice houses were. And it was those ice houses that, that made the village, the Cedar Grove, was, made it more popular, more prominent. And they have all disappeared. Eastern Steamboat Company? Eastern Steamboat Company uh, came had uh, daily trips uh, daily trips to and from Boston and Gardner. They, uh, during the summertime, peak of it, there was a, a boat uh, leaving Gardner in the afternoon and another one leaving Boston in the afternoon. They'd meet somewhere probably off the mouth of the Kennebec and Come, uh, come up and go back out in the evening. Well, that's about about all that's. The Barker Farm. Barker Farm. That. Uh, Is that an old one? Or? Uh, not as old as it seemed. Uh, you'd think it was. Uh, it's a, uh, I think, 1840. Mm -hmm. And on the left here, there's another uh -huh. farm. So your farm was just up the road here? Yes. And you, would you walk down here to... Oh, yeah. Eight years. Well, one of the buildings back there was the schoolhouse. I walked it, uh, attended school there for eight years. If you want to turn left up here on this curve. Okay. So we're getting down to the family homestead. Yes. This is the, well, now called the Everson Road. This house on the right was the boarding house for the Hathen Ice Houses, 
of the 1870-1910 era. It was moved out here, the barn built to go along with it. The uh, ice, very ice houses was on the river frontage of this farm. Can't, can't see the area from here. And what kind of livestock did you have at your farm? We just had an assortment, a few cows and uh, a horse or two, maybe a team of horses and a driving horse. Um, and this looks like very low. It is very low. It, uh, well, it was, water was all the way around this mailbox in uh, 87 flood waters. Wow. And <clears throat> so you'd have to uh, plant late crop when it dried out or? It, yes, yeah. Uh, left turn here by the sign. Sunny smelt cans. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there was a uh, Ten feet of water here in the lane in '87, uh, and how much there was here in '36, I I don't even dare guess. So your basement was always wet. No, our basement is always dry. How would you manage that? You're well, up on a mound. Huh? You uh, you stop filming and these bombs traffic over it. Uh -huh. I can't afford the gravel to. So yours is not a town road? No, it's not a town road. Uh, they did plow it, but uh, we main we somehow maintained it. But so this is the family homestead here? This uh, So you're right up on the river? Yeah, keep on. Keep on going, and it is it is up uh, high enough so that only in '36 was the water in the in the cellar. Mm -hmm. So you'd have boats right off of here that you would I, put I in the water. Boats you'd put in the. We uh we are not a boating family at all. Uh, there's plenty of stories about boats, but this uh, this is a point of land down here, and it was the Nantucket Wharf. People from Nantucket Island settled here and built the wharf, and it is it is deep water right up there to the. Why did they come here from Nantucket? All I can find out from what little research that I've done, or what little research I can find, they came to the Kennebec for wood. Uh, whether it was firewood or lumber or just what it was, I don't know. Uh, I need to do some uh, more research. People in Nantucket, uh, they, they don't seem to know anything about any and any people. What, what period would that be? Um, well, I don't know. In the 17, well, 60s or 70s, maybe? We don't know. It's, uh, the place has been in my family since 1801. And there is an old map that shows where there might have been a buildings here in 1763. Nantucket Farm and although the original Nantucket Farm included the farms to the north and south of this current acreage. A recent letter showed up uh, dated back in the I don't know if I ever did know the, the date, where they went to
to the Nantucket house. So they spent time at the Nantucket house, which may have been this place. My great-grandfather made bricks down here on this wharf. There were depressions, and I can show you a general area where they were, just what the pits were, why, how they were used, I, I don't know. But the uh, bricks were, were made here, and there's remains of bricks on the shore. Land and the land down uh, towards a lower bridge consists of about a quarter of the prime farmland in Knox and Lincoln counties combined. In fact, uh, the field to the left there is in both Dresden and Pittston, Lincoln and Kennebec counties. The, the line is part way up the field <laughs> there. But it's a hay field now? It's a hay field and it's, uh, been, it's firm enough so that the farmers have been able to get on and cut the hay without miring the, all the equipment or rutting it up. Some of the, most of the highland fields are they're leaving furrows where they travel if, if they even try to get onto the fields. This is a well-drained loam, right? It's, uh, it's sandy and sandy. It's, it's firm. The fellow that cut my hay cut right down to the edge of the swamp and I don't believe he left even a, a tire mark there. Mm. This right. building on the right is, uh, was the shop for the ice houses that were on on my frontage here. And uh, it was moved off the property when my grandfather made the ice company clean up the buildings, but it was just moved over the line onto property that they owned. They only leased the land from my great-grandfather and grandfather. And uh, my father bought it and hauled it up here in 1935 and it's a wonder the 36 flood didn't float it off but it it stayed port. That building has survived three moves, uh, three major floods, been struck by lightning before we hit it and had the lightning rods put on it and it's in pretty good shape except uh, I see some rotten wood on the one place there, but structurally it's, it is sound.